Hi, and welcome to the Building Bliss podcast. And I'm very excited today to have Emily Forbes of Wild Wellbeing as my guest. Uh, it sounds like Emily's got a really interesting story. So she's a wild woman, which I'm going to delve into in a bit to see what that is. Uh, mother of two teenage daughters, author, chronic illness warrior, and, a, and the creator of Wild Wellbeing, which I think you, you celebrated your year anniversary in October. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, welcome to the podcast. Do you want to tell us a bit about your background? Because it sounds like you've had quite a an interesting life so far. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much. And thanks for having me. Yeah, so I've created Wild Wellbeing really on the back of going through a lot of changes in my life, um, a lot of healing, recovery, and sort of different layers of loss that I've experienced, really, I suppose, in my 30s. Um, I'm coming up to I'll be 40 next year um so oh, big four -oh. <laughs> yeah absolutely so I suppose critically the last five years um I've had some really big shifts in life so things like um, divorce and you know a long-term marriage ending um bereavement uh, my mum died very young and, and sort of shockingly and unexpectedly and then um dealing with chronic illness and specifically a, a really difficult esophageal problem which means that um, I can't eat solid food or I can't swallow solid food um, it's I'm sort of on a liquid diet and I've had lots of surgeries and now I'm finally progressing to some puree so all of those sort of layers of loss I suppose um, led me to a point where I thought something is like fundamentally needs to change in life as to how I'm going to approach this because you could either approach it very negatively um, and become really you know in a quite a dark place with it mm. or you could sort of flip it round and go well what's the lesson here how can I move forward how can I live you know a life that I want to live with these different challenges or changes or losses and that's when I thought I'm going to be on a mission to help women go from places of adversity to really finding the possibility and the positivity for themselves, whatever that looks like, because I think everyone's got different circumstances. Um, and, you know, positivity and possibility and hope for me might look very different to someone else. Um, and that's why I set up Wild Wellbeing and I, I share parts of my story to really I suppose help others know that they're not alone sometimes I think when we're facing really big challenges in life or pivots or changes um, it can be quite a lonely place because you know your your sort of friendship circles can change your health can change your well-being your ability your capacity all of those things um, and I think they're still light and there's still somewhere to move forward to. And that's really what I want to help other women find. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think sometimes we get brought to wellness because of adversity, don't we? I've got a, sim you know, a similar background. And would you say you were into sort of wellness and holistic practices before all these big events happened? Or was it something that you, you were led to because of that? I think... I was probably led to it because of trying to find an answer. Often I think we're on this sort of like, you know, it feels like a bit of a quest and a journey to search for that magic pill, the magic bullet, you know, the how how am I going to mend this? How is this going to be better? And along that journey, you discover, you know, lots of different pathways, lots of different options, treatments or um, holistic therapies even things like meditation, mindfulness, you know, I, I was aware of them all before, um, but probably had never practiced, you know, them sort of on a, a regular basis to, to achieve an outcome that I wanted. So, yeah, I had an awareness, but absolutely was drawn to sort of self-help, self-development and that wellness world probably about five years ago. Yeah. Excellent. Well, as as we know, the the Bliss podcast is based on based on the five pillars of Bliss, which is bravery, laughter, inspiration, spark, and success. So we'll start with bravery because it sounds like you've had to be brave an awful lot in your life. But can you can you pinpoint one moment that you think is your bravest out of all those things that have happened? Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, 
I think, you know, looking sort of objectively, I've probably been quite brave throughout this illness. I've had a lot of surgeries and, um, you know, I lived off literally drinking four drinks a day for two and a half years. And that in itself is is just very difficult. I was physically very unwell and malnourished, but also mentally that's and psychologically it's a really hard thing to get to grips with. Um, but I think probably one of the bravest decisions that I've ever made with the most wide impacting ramifications is ending, you know, a 16 year marriage and sort of walking away from all that I'd built and all that I'd like hoped for and dreamed for. I, I left the family home. I, you know, gave that to my um, ex-husband because I didn't want the drama and the stress. And I knew that, you know, his financial status was um, in a more of a difficult position than mine. So I, I sort of, I, I left, yeah, <clears throat> I left the family home. I left the marriage. I left my hometown. I moved to a new new village, you know, not far away, um, but had to start again. And I think that after sort of going through the whole trajectory of what you thought life was going to be, making that decision was probably the bravest decision I made because I made it for me. And I made it about, I really started looking at my sort of self-care, my happiness, what I wanted to achieve in life. Whereas historically, I'd always put other people first, you know, family, kids, um, you know, the sort of the whole like, the unity of you know hosting the dinners and the everything was always about other people and i made a, a brave decision i think to put myself first yeah definitely i think that's probably the bravest decision because it had a huge impact on a lot of other people's lives as well as my own yeah it definitely is brave putting yourself first i mean i'm a recovering people pleaser <laughs> as i like to call myself and it does take a lot of bravery to do that so would you say that your illness then was the catalyst then for that decision in terms of thinking, I, I've got to do something different now because I've been presented with this lot. I mean, a lot of people do that, don't they? They get and think, oh, my God, everything isn't settled. Uh, it's not what I thought it's going to be. So I have to do something different now or I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life. Probably I made that decision was not necessarily based on my illness, but it was based on someone else's illness. So I had my own symptoms then, but I hadn't gone through, I hadn't gotten to a point where it was sort of life changingly difficult at that point. Um, but it was actually when my mum, my friend's, um, my best friend's mum was in hospital. She was in a hospice actually. And she was dying um, of, you know, of, you know, really difficult stage four cancer. I went into the hospice uh, to read her some poetry and I literally had this kind of like epiphany when I came out. So I knew it was the last time I was going to see her. I was trying to like sort of make her smile and laugh and read her poetry and give her some like familiarity. Um, and then I left and I, I literally sort of came outside and I walked along the road and I thought, is this, is this life? Does it get to this point where you're lying in a bed dying of you know uh, she was dying of you know of a horrible disease that taken everything away from her and I thought you know I'm this can't be this just can't be it um and, and then I suddenly started having this existential am I happy you know this kind of is this what I want in life <laughs> it was really strange um and I think that's when <coughs> excuse me I'm awfully sorry <laughs> That's when um, I made that fundamental decision that things were going to change. And I really questioned, you know, my marriage, relationship, circumstances, experiences, everything was after her being um, very ill and seeing her die. And then as I went through that process myself, I think my illness and, you know, the challenges and the changes I'd faced kept then bringing me back to the, that question all the time. Am I truly happy? Is this truly in my, you know, interests for my own well-being? And I very much frame most of the choices and decisions I make now using that lens. You know, is this ultimately going to be good for me, for my well-being, for my wellness? Um, and then sort of by default, it'll be good for everyone else around me. 
Yeah, well, that's a fantastic approach, I think. And I think, yeah, I've had something similar. My sister uh, was ill with cancer and is okay at the moment. But I, I was very much like, I don't want to have a bucket list when someone says you've got, you know, two months to live. I want to live now, which is part of the reason why I started doing my comedy, even though it was much later in life. So I think that is a brilliant attitude. And I think if you can keep bringing yourself back to that, it really does probably make you make the best decisions possible for your life really and, f- and for everyone around you as you say because if you're happy at your absolute core then everybody else gets the benefit of that don't they yeah yeah absolutely and sometimes you know it's really difficult I, you can't be positive all of the time you know and life happens and especially with like sort of chronic illness and symptom management and procedures and surgeries and everything you've got to go through it is really difficult but I do keep always trying to bring myself back to that uh, because if you can find the light and if you can find a bit of hope, um, then, yeah, I think that positive mindset, you can rewire your brain. You know, we've, we all know about neuroscience now and neuroplasticity and how if you think something differently, it can actually really change the sort of like nature of your body at like a cellular level. Even, you know, there's examples of people healing major traumas um major illnesses in their body purely from positive mindset positive thoughts you know and I I don't know if that's scientifically you know accepted in the research community but there are examples of it so I think well why not why not try and choose wellness why not try and choose happiness why not try and choose positivity instead of choosing um to be you know negative or um you know to feel that sort of pain and suffering because you could easily be that if you if you're suffering from illness yeah absolutely because I think as you've said with with chronic illness as well the issue is that nobody sees it or a lot of people don't see it so it's almost invisible because as you say to the outside you don't look like someone who's suffering from chronic illness but then you're fighting those daily battles all the time so that must be really important to keep that mindset because people perhaps expect a lot from you when perhaps you haven't got a lot to give on some days I I presume oh absolutely and I think that one of the big things that I've learned is about that invisibility or visibility um because it just proves doesn't it that you don't know what people are going through you absolutely you know you you have no idea if that person is struggling with you know a horrific divorce or relationship issues or they've just suffered a major bereavement or they're you know taking certain medicines five times a day or you know they can't swallow food like but you just don't know and I think I've really I suppose come to try and have some faith in that shared humanity around we are all going through um a really tough and challenging life life is hard I think you know when we're younger, you think of this like the romantic notion that life is generally good and it gets, you know, punctuated by sort of times of challenge. But when you really look at life, it's bloody hard and there's a lot yeah. of challenges and it's really tough. And actually, I try and now frame it with, well, if you accept a baseline that life is pretty challenging, how can you punctuate it with more joy, with more fun, with more laughter? with more, you know, living in the moment, all of those things, because we're absolutely not guaranteed that tomorrow is going to come. We, we, I know that now from, you know, personal tragedy in life um, and also from having really chronic illness where I genuinely thought at one point um, I was facing, you know, death. I, my body was shutting down. I, I, couldn't, I hadn't eaten for so long. My menstruation stopped. Um, I'd shed all my body mass and my muscle um I I was like a really depleted in terms of energy and physical capability and yeah I I think that now it's all about well you know be in the present moment and and live for now and do as much as you possibly can to enjoy what you're doing right now in this right in this moment because that's all that's guaranteed absolutely and I think I've found certainly with this year it's been personally challenging for me that the highest of highs come generally with the lowest of lows and you can't you can't eradicate those lows so as you say you've just got to kind of ride <laughs> ride that wave as best you can and, and and bring as much joy as you can into your life I think that's the um the point that I want to help women with is the 
navig it's about navigating the journey because the highs and lows will be there anyway it's how you navigate how you cope with how you deal with what tools you can use to maintain your internal compass of balance even if you're being tossed about on this stormy sea you know it's about trying to find a place where you can at least seek some comfort and sort of refuge from the storm and often that's within yourself I think yeah so you bra- we've got our baseline bravery is there anything that you feel you're gonna have to be brave going forward because I know you've got a book coming out haven't you or you, you've written your book when when's the plan to publish that yes. do you think that's going to take a bit of bravery to get it over the line and get out there absolutely I mean I think being vulnerable in itself is quite brave and I will admit that for a few quite a few years I I very much hid behind a mask of um I'm the doer the fixer the maker the the sorter out of problems that you know everything's okay and I did hide behind I didn't really tell people how much the illness was affecting me affecting my daily life um and not just the physical bits because people could see that but the psychological impact and the emotional impact of it so I think vulnerability in itself and sort of like that admission that you're not okay or that you're not you know running on full cylinders or that you're not this super amazing being that you kind of put this face onto the world stripping back all those layers and saying you know I'm human and you know I can sort of you know be broken just as much as other people and I can be lost just as much as other people whereas historically I probably wouldn't have ever done that so I think there does take some bravery and being vulnerable um but also I want to get the message out about living with invisible illness so I think that my book is going to be my my sort of way of doing that so that other women can learn from lessons that I've gone through myself and will already have had someone who's experienced that because it's quite difficult to find information about someone who's gone through the ups and downs of chronic illness, someone in their 30s. Um, you know, a lot of sort of medical information out there or research is especially around for me around swallowing issues um, and the technical term dysphagia is sort of like after stroke or after disability or after a big accident or maybe um, later on in life as well as, you know, the sort of older people. I found it difficult to find something that I could relate with. So I'm hoping that by offering this book to the world, you know, it's going to sort of some someone can look at that and go, oh, wow, these challenges, other people have faced them and they've gotten through them and they've managed to sort of find a sort of toolbox of coping mechanisms. And really, that's what my book's going to be about is not only my journey, um, but using that journey to then help others with the lessons. Yeah. And I think as you touched on before, it's about hope, isn't it? Giving somebody else hope that who might be in that sort of pit of despair that, you know, whether they're newly diagnosed or they feel very isolated of going, even if you can find one person who is thriving despite it, it gives you something to to hang on to, doesn't it? Absolutely. So moving on to the L then of laughter. How how important mm. is laughter in getting you through the tough times? Because uh, you you told me beforehand that you're not considered a funny person, but th- <laughs> but what but what? How important is laughter to you generally in life? I I, I think laughter is great because it's. I mean, often you you say to people, oh, "I'm going to laugh so I don't cry." I've said that so many times, and so have my friends yeah. to me. Um. But that could sound like it's about bypassing the negativity and sort of covering it up with the laughter. And for me, that's not a, you know, it's not a good idea to do that. I have sort of repressed some emotions previously, um, pretended, you know, or or compartmentalised them. So I think that like real laughter, barely laughter, um, the kind of laughter you have with, you know, I would have with the girls maybe on a night out, my, you know, closest best mates who've been there through everything kind of thing. Um, is a major way of releasing emotion. It is like having a cathartic cry, Um, you know, just laughing over really silly slapstick funny things or, I don't know, the kids make me laugh. Um, Sometimes some of their opinions make me laugh or their opinions of me make me laugh, which is quite (laughs) funny. 
especially when they say things like, oh, mum, you're going all woo woo now. You know, if I talk to them about maybe a bit more about spirituality or um, and they're like, oh, you know, that's that's too far, mum. Um, I get I get that. But yeah, when I get my crystals out. I'm uh, yeah. I'm like, oh, here she comes with her mumbo jumbo crystals. Yeah. So I, f- I feel your pain on that one. <laughs> yeah. So No. So they make me laugh. But they also say that I'm not a very comedic person. I'm not very good at getting jokes. So I understand. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, I've never been quite good at understanding sarcasm or the sort of like dry humour in life. I'm I'm. I can understand the, you know, the obvious sort of slapstick humour. And it's, yeah, I think laughter is really important. I think um, when I was, you know, in feeling really, really unwell and poorly, my brother um, and I and my partner went to a comedy club and I hadn't been out for yonks, absolutely ages, probably like the best part of a year. And it was my birthday and things had been a really tough time and, I'd been really depressed and down with the illness and we went to a comedy club and it was amazingly uplifting. I felt like great emotionally and spiritually and, you know, excited and just, yeah, it was just nice to laugh. And actually, again, it's that duality because the juxtaposition of me sat there with a, a liquid sort of um, Complan shake, which is, is a nutritional prescribed drink that you get from the from the hospital for for malnutrition and they were sat there with their you know sloppy pizzas and loaded fries and beers and so like the actual that in itself you know being and I thought well in that moment I could have cried I could have sat there and thought you know what it's my birthday I can't eat the food I can't drink the alcohol I'm sat here with this bloody shake but actually I was in a comedy club having a really fun time my brother was home from Singapore where he lives I was with people I love laughing and it was great it was a really good medicine so sometimes it's about accepting I think the the duality of joy with suffering of you know laughter and pain but yeah I think it's important I think it's important that we we can have that um release all those happy hormones and and share in laughter with others as well yeah I think I think you release oxytocin dopamine and oh what's the other one endorphins that's that if when you laugh and, um, and especially when you laugh together in a collective at a comedy club and I think well it's something certainly I obviously being a comedian it's something that I've heavily used to deal or help deal with trauma in, in a way of um, laughing at things you know eventually is very cathartic and I find I talk a lot about my childhood and, and my relationships with with people my, my mum that isn't very good and people come up to me after me and they say that was so healing to know that somebody else is going through the same thing uh and that's why that's why you know I love laughter and, and the healing through humor because you can sort of transmute that pain eventually the, the, the equation is tragedy plus time equals comedy so obviously you still need to process the emotions of these things but eventually we can laugh at it and I think that is really healing. So have you got any favourite comedians that you, you really enjoy? Um, not particularly. What I what I enjoy if, if we're watching something is more of a, um, you know, when you get like the variety of, you oh, know, right. like a, a late night with and just listening to like all the different um, sort of like jokes and opinions. I quite like, I quite like watching women because there's something empowering about that for me that historically there hasn't been that many, you know, comedian females necessarily on comedian circuits. And over the last, I don't know, I mean, you're, you're more of a specialist than me, but probably a few decades that's, that's improved, doesn't it? And again, there's something, I don't know, quite wild. So wild wellbeing, um, wild spelt W Y L D E is this sort of like, old English term for meaning untamed and right, yes, untethered yeah and, and, and that's where I quite like that whole kind of like a woman standing up on stage being outspoken saying things that societally they shouldn't say you know being in a place that they societally you know shouldn't be um putting their head above the parapet and that's what I that's what sort of being untethered untamed and sort of that kind of freedom from societal expectation of what women was used to be you know traditionally 
Um, that's what I like. So whether it's a comedian or a speaker or a lecturer or a presenter or anything, I quite like seeing women in those kind of visible places. Yeah, well, that's great. Yeah, because I, I do a lot of all female nights where the audience is mainly all female as well. And yeah, I think wild in that sense is a very good description of untamed, untethered, because as you say, we have, haven't had that voice and we haven't had that platform previously. So to have a microphone mm. and say what the hell you like is very empowering and everybody feels very empowered and, and feels they leave feeling uplifted from it. So, yeah, I yeah, love that absolutely. definition. I'm going to store that away. <laughs> so moving on to inspiration then, who mm. or what are your sources of, of inspiration? I think probably growing up, I loved reading and my kind of like inspirational sort of literary heroines were people like Tess of the D'Urbervilles or maybe Jane Eyre or Little Women. And again, I think it's probably because they faced trauma, they faced tragedy. They were all on these kind of like epic journeys and managed to pick their way through. And I've probably got a real affinity with them, maybe more so now, you know, with hindsight looking back. But at the time, mm. used to, yeah, they, I used to love, I used to love, you know, women writers as well, women poets. So it's obviously, I think I've, all, I've always been quite bold, um, always been quite sort of outspoken, definitely say things that people have told me before, you know, you need more tact, when actually I've said, well, I'm just truthful and you know I like honesty and I like truth mm. and yes sometimes it can hurt but I'm not meaning it in an in a you know a, a horrible or a detrimental way or a malicious way I just like being honest and open um so yeah I think any I think yeah those kind of literary heroines probably inspire me anyone really with inspirational stories of sort of grit determination um triumph over adversity yeah there that that's where my inspiration probably comes from yeah so it sounds like you're very heavily into to the literary world and literature and so that's inspired you to become a writer yourself would you say yeah absolutely i i think secretly i've always wanted to be a writer um i used to write poetry and normally for sort of like big occasions like uh, family weddings or funerals um, or when people were you know going through sort of big changes in life maybe like births or you know those kind of things I would write them a poem as their sort of gift um, and yeah always loved poetry studied English literature as well um, so yeah always wanted to I think always had writing in me just maybe didn't know in what way that writing would come through. Mm. Would you ever go out and perform your poems? Because there's quite a big spoken word circuit now where people perform poetry. Would you fancy doing that yourself? Oh, wow. Um, not thought about that. A lot of my poems, I would suggest, are very deep and um, quite sort of like heart-wrenching. And I'm quite good at writing poetry in sorrow, a bit like Adele with her music, I suppose. You know, she has all these major albums over like heartbreak, doesn't she? And again, I think a lot of my poems are probably quite good about, you know, loss or love or heartbreak or those kind of. Um, but then I have had some celebratory poetry, too, around, you know, new things coming into life, new opportunities or, or friends, you know, weddings, etc. Um, but whether or not I'd want to, I, I might publish them maybe one day, I think, you know, get a, yeah. a little book of poems out into the world. But whether or not people would want to listen to them. I think they might end. <laughs> they wouldn't be leaving a comedy club <laughs> laughing. They might be ending well, up crying. Yeah, I mean, the, there's comedy, one, but there are ones that are, you know, they're not all comedy, that they are just spoken word of, of all varieties. So mm -hmm. it might be something that, yeah, you could do. But yeah, publishing them would be great. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Donna Ashworth. Um, oh, yes. All her poems. Yeah, so. Yes, could have absolutely. I've seen a lot of those yeah. on grief and love and they're really heart rendering those ones yeah really love them yeah great so I think we've already touched on this really but it sounds like you'd really love your story and journey to be an inspiration to others yeah 
Yeah, absolutely. I think sometimes you need an example of what things can look like, don't you, as a sort of reference point. And you might have that in literature or novels or, you know, films, but seeing someone's real life and like the reality of, you know, big changes, big decisions, um, big challenging circumstances, you know, the big emotions of life being put into a book that you can then reference or read or learn from, I'm I'm hoping will be inspiring in itself. And, you know, we'll, we'll be able to help people through some of really dark times because there, there have been times in my journey where I've really been lonely, really depressed and, and thought there was no sort of future or way out. Um, and I want to inspire people to know that there always is. It's just that things might look different now to how you expected them to look. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean that that's not OK. Yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that's a really important point that we have sometimes such a clear idea of where we think we're headed or, as you said before, what life should look like, that when we're presented with something that's completely different, that's what really sort of sets you into the despair, isn't it? Because you're, all you're thinking of, you're just yearning for that life that you think you should have. I mean, I've called it in, in my book, and then other people do, living grief, because it's it's a grief for something that you've you you can no longer have what you used to have um mm. and sometimes that can be really hard so you know i'd love for example like physically used to go hiking a lot um you know at waterfalls or um i used to go running i used to be really physically active which i can't be anymore um but instead of looking at that as a dead end and saying well i need to you know i'm i'm mourning for that bit of myself that i used to have actually now it's more about well what can i do so mm. what can i take control of where do i have agency what is available to me now you know in this current situation if i'm accepting this situation truly as it is right now what can i do and then that tries to bring you back from the kind of ruminating on the past um and it's you know i've i found it really difficult to be in the present moment because I've done a lot of, you know, ruminating on what used to be and how life used to be. And also a lot of thinking about the future. Well, what will life be and what could it be? But being in the present moment, um, it can really help you ground you and bring you back to life as it is right now and stop you looking back at that sort of grieving and that mourning. It's almost like you have to mourn and, you know, close that chapter on that bit of life. And now you're opening a new chapter with, you know, new parameters and with new opportunities that, you know, five years ago, I wouldn't be on a podcast with you talking about moving from illness to wellness. So actually, Mm. there are positives to come from everything. There are learnings to come. There's a way that, as you said, you can, you know, transmute that trauma, that pain, that suffering. You can turn it with time, with growth, with development. You can really turn it into something positive. Yeah, I love that. What can I do? I think that's a great little phrase. I think anybody could use and apply to any situation and say, well, this is the this is the hand I've been dealt. What can I do? Yeah, I love that. So is the hope that you'll sort of grow a bit of community around your book and, and get out there and talk about it and meet people and, and sort of have forums so that other people can find a group of people in the same position? Yes, absolutely. I want to be able to sort of bring my story to the world, um, hopefully be published and flown globally to talk to everyone at book launches, which would be amazing, wouldn't it? Um, Yeah. And and really sort of like share that that living reality with the possibility of, um, if you can really find your sort of authentic self, I think, take off all those layers, strip everything back, regardless of whether you're going through illness, um, even if it's just a big life transition or a life change. If you truly look at your core and the essence, your sort of like authentic self, right? What do you need? What do you want? Um, You know, what's going to light you up? What's going to bring you joy? Then you can move forward in a, a sort of 
a much more fulfilled and content way because you're accepting things as they are now, but you're also um, moving forward knowing that you're not alone in this process. And that's, you know, I think being able to share my story, uh, share with women on different, you know, stages. Next year, I'm actually running a workshop um, at Womanifest, so the Self-Development oh, and Empowerment yeah. Festival. Um, I'm running a workshop on grow through what you go through because it's all about well what you know what tools and tips can I give to other women to grow through what they go through because I've been through quite a lot of you know sort of experiences myself and yeah that's absolutely what I want to do with the book is to um, help other people you know find their way. Great well I, I'm Building Bliss is actually sponsoring the wellness tent at, at Will Manifest so I'm going to get you to come and do my comedy workshop and get you to write two minutes of comedy so your kids can stop saying that you're not funny. You can write a funny poem. That can be your, your mission. Fabulous. <laughs> Great. So moving on to Spark then, how did you find your spark when, when everything seemed pretty bleak? What, mm. what, what did you what, what did you draw on to try and get that spark back or at least ignite a bit of a spark so that you could move forward to wellness? Yeah, difficult because when you're in the throes of everything, you know, it can be a really yeah, isolating and dark and difficult place. And I definitely lost my spark, definitely. Um, and I remember writing in my journal. I mean, that's one thing that I, I would suggest. I mean, I, I suppose maybe for me, writing is therapeutic, but writing in a journal, how I was feeling, what emotions I was having, what I wanted to feel like, um, you know, sort of trying to unpick a lot of the emotional side of the illness and the sort of that grief side of things. Um, the loneliness, the isolation, and coming up with, well, what can I do differently? But I think that the moment I had a sort of the spark of realisation of drawing a line and moving forward is is probably quite a um, quite a miserable uh, circumstance. But I remember, I remember it really clearly. I was looking in the mirror one day and I, I really didn't recognise myself. I, I was looking, you know, at myself in the mirror and I, and I remember thinking, like, who are you? You know, you're you're not you. You're not this joyous, exuberant, bright, outgoing, um, you know, happy, full of life, vibrant person. Like, where have you gone? And I walked out the bathroom mirror and I literally had this kind of like moment where I thought no one is coming to save you. And that that is like a real moment of realisation that you know you can you can try and externally seek your validation your healing your recovery your answers your solutions but no one was coming to save me you know the surgeons weren't the consultants the nhs my partner my friends no one could actually magic it all away and i had this realization that the only person that's going to be able to do that is you. You're going to have to strip it right back to basics and just start from scratch. And that was things like um, really simple, you know, looking at the basics, which is what a lot of people talk about, say after like burnout, when you get to a point of utter physical and emotional exhaustion with whatever you're facing, whether it's chronic stress, whether it's chronic illness, you know, you get to that real bit of burnout, you have to go back to the very, very basics. Like nutrition was a difficult one for me because I, I couldn't give myself what I needed nutritiously, but I thought, right, well, what about my sleep? What about my rest? What about my, you know, alone time? What about um, time to sort of sit and be with my thoughts? What about meditation? All the, you know, what about maybe massage or having some, re you know, relaxing music on? So how can I sort of go right back to the the very basics of humanity and life to build that pillar up again. Um, mm. That was what really sparked me to think, I've got to move forward. You know, I need a plan. I need to build um, my life back, even if it looks different, even if I'm in a situation where I can't eat solid food, 
even if, you know, I can't get the amount of nutrients I want to go for a long walk or to do an activity or to work even, you know, all of those things. Um, and that's when I started journaling and that's when I started really focusing on my own wellness, my own well-being and looked more at self-care as well. And, you know, what was I doing every day, every single day? I needed to do at least something to make me feel good. And at that time, making me feel good was just being able to um, be in a cosy place, you know, you know, making a nest at home feel like it decluttered even, maybe some nice candles or incense on, just feeling like you were being cocooned in healing and in love. And if I couldn't get that from anyone else, I had to give that to myself. And that was a real eye-opening moment for me, I think. I'd never thought about that before. I always thought that other people gave you love, other people gave you care, other people looked after you. Um, and I had to give that to myself. And that was a big lesson. Mm. And that that's a real that is a real wake up call to to stand there and think, no one's coming to save me. I've got to do this myself. Yeah, it was it was, you know, as I, you know, everything I think is double edged sword in life, isn't it? Because there's one side, like you could, it depends, you know, in what situation you were, you could take that in a really, um, you know, sort of soul breaking, lonely, isolating spot that, mm. and I was there, I was in that place, I really was, I was thinking, you know, I'm in this dark hole, and I want someone to throw me a rope, and no one's bloody throwing me a rope, no one's pulling me out, and that something must have just flicked, or, you know, a switch just flicked in me, and just, I thought, no, I'm, I'm bloody well going to do this. You know, I'm determined. I'm I'm not going to be that ill, sickly, fragile, weak person. I was just determined that I was going to, you know, make life better. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like you've got such inner resilience that, yeah, that you've had to call upon and it's really stood you in good stead to, to deal with everything that's been thrown at you. Yeah, I'm... I'm definitely resilient is one of the, I suppose, if you asked, you know, my sort of closest group of fr friends and family how to describe me, I think resilience would come up a lot because, mm. yeah, I've definitely had my fair share of trials and tribulations and trauma. Um, and, you know, there's been really hard times. I'm not bypassing those at all. You know, I've been, you know, really in the throes of despair and hopelessness and helplessness. Um but I have managed to pull myself out and to put myself first. And I think, again, that whole kind of, you know, right back to the five years ago when I made that realisation and that decision, you know, what do I want in life? What's good for me? What's making me happy? What about me? Where am I in all of this? Not the family, not the kids, not the husband, not the partner. Where am I? Um that's where I keep coming back to. And I think that's a good place to keep settling and landing to make sure that you're really attuning to what your gut is telling you, you know? Hmm. So would, would resilience have been on your school reports? Was that a word you would have associated yourself with when you were younger? Or is that something that's developed oh. because of the adversity? Wow. Interesting question. Um, I think my school report said that I was effervescent, which I used to quite like. I think that was a great I like word. That, yeah. Um I know, effervescent. Chatty, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Um yeah. outspoken, talks way too much. Um but resilient. I don't know. I don't know if they would have said resilient. Um I mean, in terms of sort of bravery and when you're younger and everything, it depends, I suppose, what you mean, because I think bravery from the point of view of doing something you're afraid of, like that's physically going to put you in danger, you know, like, I don't know, roller coasters or big rides. Yeah. Um, I was definitely, yeah, I was definitely braver when I was younger in that respect. Um I was much more willing to, you know, take physical risks then. But I think as I've gotten older, I'm probably more braver in a different, you know, a more of a quiet fearlessness that I'm willing to do 
things that aren't expected or that go against the grain or that aren't the norm or that, you know, change things up and take the risks in that kind of way. So it's sort of like a bit of a, maybe a, an external bravery when I was younger. I was, you know, always sort of loud and brash and I'd be the first to jump off a cliff or you know, that kind of thing, swimming and all the rest of it. Um, but then as I've gotten older, much braver maybe in the way, yeah, I think about things or my actions maybe. Mm. Yeah, and I think that, that's been a common theme, actually, with a lot of the other guests of that more risk averse in the traditional sense, but sort of less caring about worrying what other people think with the decisions that you're Absolutely. making. And I think that's definitely something that comes with age uh, uh, as well in uh, as women, definitely. Yes, I agree. So moving on to success then. Um what does success look like to you? Do you know what? Interestingly, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the internal and external sort of dichotomy about bravery, because I think success for me now is very much an internal game. And it is about the sort of feeling or all the, I suppose, the, yeah, the emotions, the feelings, the sensations of finding bliss finding ease, finding flow, feeling that like calm, that inner peace, that comfort and like the sort of simplicity around, you know, success for me is that I've got healthy and happy children that are thriving. Success, you know, is that it may be that my symptoms of my illness aren't so bad today as they were yesterday, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. And that's a very kind of an in again, an internal experience of success. Whereas historically, success for me was much more an external affair. It was achievements, awards, um, you know, being on the stage or, you know, being at the pinnacle of your career or getting a certificate or having the perfect, you know, 2.4 family unit or, you know, it was very, that success was very external for me previously. And now it's much more an internal feeling of success, a feeling, I just, you know, I just want that kind of fulfillment, that sense of purpose, that feeling that I'm doing the best with what I've got and that life is good. That's a, that's very much an inside feeling of success. Yeah, and I think that's, it's definitely, again, something that comes with age, but that sounds like it's linked to that living in the moment because that is literally your daily goal you're looking at success on a daily basis of how successful is today in terms of, you know, my health and what I can do. And I think that really must help keep you in the present moment. Yes, absolutely. And, and also for anyone that's, you know, going through anything that's taking a long time or process, um, I always say to myself, you know, it's progress, not perfection, because 12 weeks ago, yesterday I you know I had major surgery and 12 weeks ago I look back and I I couldn't I was only drinking liquid and 12 weeks later and I'm now managing to eat some puree and some you know I'm I'm much more sort of like alert awake up and about I'm doing small walks I've started driving the car again um which for the last you know for nine weeks I didn't even because of the wounds on my stomach etc etc so it's all about looking back at how far you've come as well in any journey that you're on. And sometimes you think, oh, well, it's not really progress and I've not really got very far. And yesterday doesn't look very much different to today. But if you look back three months, six months, 12 months, you think, wow, you know, I've I've really come far. And again, that's an internal knowing of success that no one else knows. You know, the external world won't know that because they won't know what you've been through. Um, and yeah, I keep bringing myself back to that, but look at where you are now from where you've been, you know, at the situations that you've been in and look how far you've come and how things have changed. And yes, it's, you know, it's, things are different now, but that doesn't mean that they can't still be great. It's just reframing what great now looks like for me. Yeah. And I think that's something that we don't stop to reflect very much, do we? Because society generally is always about the future and where we're going, what we're getting, how we're doing that. And, and we don't stop and reflect. And it's one of the most powerful things I think you can do is to stop and go, wow, actually, in the last 12 months, what's 
I've achieved and, and what's happened to me, it's pretty phenomenal that I'm, I'm where I am right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we don't, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for what we go through. Um, and I think this is probably as women, um, everyone is always so used to, you know, the rat race, the sort of like hamster wheel, the, the spinning all the plates, doing all the things, you know, having the mother load that, that it's called, you know, which in itself perpetuates it even more. But, you know, remembering birthdays, anniversaries, parties, pickups, drop offs, all that stuff that also comes with being a woman. Um, we don't ever really stop, pause and then think about, well, well, where's me in that? And how is this affecting me, impacting me? You know, what do I want? And having that reflection period, not only on where we've been, um, you know, where we've come from, but also I think we need to reflect on what we've taken on, but also what we've let go of. Because I think success for me is also about letting go of a lot. It's about, you know, that grip and that control on life that we all think we have. We don't bloody have any control really over what's going to happen tomorrow. And, and I think, you know, we're, we want, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a person that does like to be controlled and planned and, you know, on top of everything and fully aware of what's happening and, you know, all the rest of it. But letting go is just as powerful sometimes as holding on, if not more. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think a lot of I mean, I'm a Buddhist, so that's a very Buddhist philosophy of that trying to grasp onto something that's actually transient. There, There is no permanence in anything and you don't know what's coming. So, yeah, letting go actually gives you so much more freedom, uh, you, you know, removing expectations and actually opens up possibilities because you're not grasping onto something so tightly that's never going to happen. And yeah, absolutely. Removes the pressure and that kind of like, you know, that pressure cooker that's going to explode because you hold on so tightly to the outcome. Um, yeah. Feels feels more easeful and more freeing and more blissful. Definitely. Yeah. Though not hard. You know, I'm not I'm not <laughs> pretending that it's easy because it's absolutely yeah. not. But if you get through it, then yes, it does feel better. Yeah. So how in terms of like looking forward do you tend not to look too far into the future and just take each day by day or do you have to have one eye on that with your condition and, and how that's going to be managed as you get older yeah I think I'm I'm able to look in sort of like the near future um and I do think about you know next month next six months maybe even like, you know, next year in terms of things I want to achieve or, you know, what I want to do or things I want to focus on. Um, in terms of the illness, I don't know if it's going to get progressively worse because as you get older, everything changes. Um, and, as, you know, muscles, you know, deteriorate and the soft muscle at the bottom of the esophagus um, is something that you can't control. You can't sort of train it or you can't make it stronger or change it or anything. So if the muscles, you know, stop pulling food or or puree at the moment through, then it may be back to liquid. Um, but I think I'm more of the sort of, I'm more able now to be comfortable with the unknown of that. I think historically, I wanted to know, well, what happens next? What does that mean for tomorrow? What does that mean for three months time? Um, I still would like to know, uh, and there's always a part of me that wants to have like a finite answer or a finite reason. I think that's, you know, part of, I'm extremely curious person and, and I think curiosity is not only one of my big values, but I think, you know, humans, we are very curious. Um, mm -hmm. and so I've always wanted to know, but I, I temper that now with, well, actually, what really matters is here and now. What really matters is what's going on at the moment. What really matters is the, you know, the sort of day to day things that you're facing, not necessarily what you're going to be facing in 12 months time. There's no point in worrying about something that you can't possibly predict or possibly change. Um, and that's the hard bit about being present, isn't it? It's that you've got to get that balance right between ruminating on the past and what's gone worrying about the future and what's to come 
and just accepting being in the moment. And that can be really difficult when you want to plan and you want to change things. Um, so, yeah, it's always a balance. And it's something I'm working on, finding that balance, definitely. It sounds like you're doing a great job to me because you're, you're, you're holding a lot of <laughs> concepts there that are obviously working for you. So, um, yeah, I think it will really inspire a lot of other people that are listening to uh, hear about all those different aspects of your personality that you've had to develop to cope with what's been thrown at you. So, yeah, that's mm. been really interesting. So our closing tradition on the Building Bliss podcast is to ask you what you think your younger self could would say to you if they could see you now. Well, I think first my younger self would say, oh, my gosh, you're nearly 40. Wow, that's that's old. <laughs> because I think when I was, you know, 14, 15, 16, I used to think that that was old and that life was over by that point. Um also, they probably say, I thought you were going to be, you know, a journalist. I, I, I thought I was going to be a political journalist, you know, exposing um, the injustices of an evil system on the world. Um, and then they'd say, well, you know, you're still, I suppose I'm writing still in that kind of, you know, I always thought I'd be writing. I might not be writing in a newspaper, Um but I'm hoping that writing my book is still the same sort of global platform of making change. So I think they'd be, or she'd be proud that I was making a difference um, with my message and be proud that I'm, you know, I'm doing okay. I've, you know, I've been through a lot of adversity and I'm using that to move forward and to try and have, you know, the vibrant, happy, full life that we all want. So yeah, I think, I think she'd say well done. Yeah, I, d I definitely think she'd be very proud of you because uh, yeah, it's been it's been amazing to listen to your story and and your approach to to it and your philosophy. So thank you very much for that and for your time. Do you just want to give us a bit of a rundown of where people can find you and maybe is have you got a date for your book that when it's coming out or is it still in its final draft form yes still in, still in final draft um my manuscript is so i haven't got a date yet um but people can find me online if you want to go to the website it's wild wellbeing w-y-l-d-e uh, dot uk um or i'm over on instagram at wild wellbeing coaching um, and you can get in touch with me to learn about how i can you know help you on your journey too that's been excellent. Well, thanks. It's been lovely to meet you and, and hear your story. And thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, I really think that um, it's a great message that you're getting out there. And I hope that people will get a lot of benefit from listening to this story uh, when the episode goes out.